The first cameras in the world, believe it or not, had people inside of them to create the image. To help you understand, it wasn't really your modern day 4K rock steady stabilized DJI action for pro. It was more like a dark giant box with a hole and a painter inside. Light from the outside passed through the hole and this projected an image which the painter sketched. To be honest, it was more of a device helping you to create a sketch, but this giant device was called Camera Obscura. It's been over at least five centuries since the Camera Obscura. A complete industry has risen and fallen, but what's really crazy is if you look at this industry today, 7.18 million digital cameras were shipped in 2023, and 7.08 million of those were created by Japanese brands. If you would create a pie chart of this data, you would end up with the Japanese flag. Coincidence? I think not. So how did the Japanese become so good at making cameras, especially if you consider Europe's head start of being inside of them? Well, in 1685, German author Johann Zahn invented a prototype for the camera obscura that was small enough to be portable and good enough to not need people inside anymore. The device was not capable of capturing images yet, it only projected images on a surface. But in 1826, Joseph Nicephor Nieps created a real prototype of a photographic camera and the first ever non-fading photograph was made. He used a portable camera obscura to expose a plate coated with light sensitive material. The photo was a view from the window of his house and you can tell he forgot to turn autofocus on me. It's not the best. This is the oldest photograph in the world. Almost next year is gonna be 200 years old so it's absolutely historical. Next year we'll have 200 years worth of photos. It's gonna be cool. While I was working on this video, I reached out to the iFilm Museum here in Amsterdam to find out if I could see some of these historic cameras for myself. Uh, they have a very cool exposition on the history of the moving image. However, things got a lot better because they invited me to see their entire archive and I got to see some historic cameras and projectors. They even have an original cinematograph from the Lumiere brothers. Now in this video I will focus more on photography because that's where it started but let me know if you'd love to see a video on the history of the moving image next because I saw some incredible stuff at the iFilm Museum. Alright, so 1826 first photograph. In the hundred years after, a lot of huge developments and improvements to cameras were made. Going from emulsion plates, wet plates, to using dry plates, to inventing film rolls, to being able to capture color. They were all huge breakthroughs. However, it wasn't until the 1930s that the start of the rise of the Japanese camera brands can be observed. During this time, the leading camera brands were Germany's Leica and Zeiss and American Kodak. Popular cameras during this time were the Leica 2, Contax 1 and the Rolleiflex Standard. During this time, the first Japanese brands like Canon and Nikon also started making cameras. However, they were heavily influenced by the German brands. And when I say heavily influenced, they I mean they were basically cheap fake replicas. Canon modeled their first camera after the Leica 2 and Nikon focused on creating lenses and basically modeled the ones from Carl Zeiss. Quick fun fact, Nikon is a combination word of the Japanese word Nip Nihon, which means Japan, and the German brand Zeiss Icon. So back then they implied uh, that the company was the Japanese equivalent of the German brand. It wasn't there yet, but things were about to change. Before things change in this story, I quickly want to show you that the direction of this channel also slightly changed because um, I'm now trying to focus on these documentary type YouTube videos with high quality. Uh, and if you look at my past two videos, I'm really proud of how they turned out. Now, I'd love to show you how I tried to create those amazing videos by looking at the audio track of the first part of this current video. If you look at the audio track, you can see uh, a music track and a couple of sound effects below. Uh, I think it's extremely important to have good music and good sound effects because it's something that you don't consciously notice, but you can definitely feel it. I've got quite a big local library of Artlist music because I've been using them for quite a long time, but they recently added this extension in Premiere Pro that allows you to download all of their, all of their music and sound effects from within Premiere Pro. And that is really a game changer because it saves you so much time of switching between your folders, your Chrome browser, your downloading tabs. I absolutely love it. Now, another thing that's really, really amazing is their AI voiceover feature. It's so good, it's almost scary. And it's also 
possible to do that from within Premiere Pro with a, with a simple click of a button. Artlist makes the process of making incredible videos a lot easier, which helps you to make more and better content. Uh, and for this video, I decided to reach out to them and ask them if they wanted to sponsor the video. They said yes. So there's a beautiful link down in the description that gets you uh, two free months uh, if you get their annual plan. All right, back to cameras. So up to this point, Japanese camera brands were basically seen as cheap replicas. This was before the Second World War. The Second World War dramatically disrupted the global camera industry. Uh, during the war, many camera companies around the world were forced to make war equipment. And a famous example of this equipment was that Nikon produced a 15 meter long rangefinder for the infamous battleship Yamato. The war forced them to make progress in optics quickly, which was later transferred back to cameras after the war. Now, if you look at Germany after the war, camera factories were damaged, destroyed or split up between East and West Germany. Japanese factories were also heavily bombed during the war, but Japan benefited from the US occupation after the war. The US wanted to rebuild Japan as a capitalist ally against communism. They invested heavily in its economy, and this allowed industries to recover and thrive. The second reason for the Japanese rise in the camera industry was a philosophical one. After World War II, a new philosophy was implemented in Japan called Kaizen. This term translates to continuous improvement or change for the better. It refers to a philosophy or practice that focuses on making tiny but continuous improvements. Kaizen was famously used by Toyota as part of its Toyota production system. Workers and managers at Toyota were encouraged to suggest small improvements in manufacturing processes. And these changes, while very small, they collectively resulted in significant increases in efficiency, quality and cost effectiveness over time. The Toyota production system became the most efficient and reliable one in the world. So it helped lots of industries in Japan as well as the camera industry. Another reason for the rise of Japanese camera brands is that in the 1950s, Japanese camera makers shifted their focus to a new specific type of camera, the SLR, the single lens reflex camera. Before the 1950s, most popular cameras looked like they had multiple lenses, uh, just like an iPhone today. However, your iPhone today also has multiple sensors, one sensor behind each lens. Cameras back then did not. Back then, these extra lenses helped you to see the image and the other one was for capturing the image. So your captured image wasn't exactly the same as the one you saw through your viewfinder. And this was called a TLR, Twin Lens Reflex Camera. Could also be a rangefinder camera or box camera. The single lens reflex camera used mirrors to reflect the exact scene into the viewfinder and that offered a more accurate preview of your shot. However, the first SLRs also weren't perfect. The image in the viewfinder appeared reversed and that made it very difficult to compose shots. This issue was fixed in the 50s with the introduction of the Penta Prism, a component that corrected the reversed image. And this breakthrough also allowed photographers to shoot at eye level. And that was a feature that made the cameras even more popular. Alongside these developments, another important thing happened in the global media about cameras and the Korean War. An American photojournalist, David Douglas Duncan, discovered that the quality of Nikkor lenses was exceptional. When his war photos were sent to Life magazine, they also found them exceptionally sharp and contrasty and basically better. In the 1950s, the New York Times published an article about Nikkor lenses saying, the lenses are highly accurate and efficient and by comparison with German lenses, more uniform in quality. There's no reason why the Japanese should not be able to keep on producing these lenses. They have the tradition of skill which they can turn in any direction and are basically perfectionists. The Kaizen philosophy was starting to pay off. Japanese lenses and cameras were surpassing German brands in quality. By 1962, Japanese companies were producing 3.12 million cameras annually and they surpassed Germany in becoming the world's top producer. Around 12 years later, Kodak invented the first ever digital camera. The future is digital. However, Kodak didn't really put much focus on this invention because they made so much money from their film sales. Japanese companies, on the other hand, focused heavily on the digital camera revolution because they were very skilled in electronics manufacturing. Japanese companies like Sony, Canon and Nikon became the dominant players and started to lead the industry. 
Now, if we look at the most recent past, we can say that the entire camera industry has been wiped out by a lot because of smartphones. Smartphone cameras have become incredible and definitely good enough for the majority of people. If you take a look at the iPhone's camera, Sony still makes the sensor inside of the camera, so there are still some points going to Japan in this new wave photo industry. Smartphones have also introduced computational photography, which is a big reason for why iPhone pictures are known to take such great photos. It's the post-processing after you snap a pic that uses software and algorithms to enhance and improve the picture. If you want to know more about this topic and see all the sources of this video, check out the video description. I've linked all of them below. Uh, thanks so much to Artlist for sponsoring this video. If you want to see more YouTube documentaries like this, uh, perhaps next month there will be one with the help of the Eye Film Museum here in Amsterdam. Uh, check out the channel, give it a little subscription perhaps, and you'll be notified about when that comes out. Thanks so much for watching.